So this proof I've just shown you is like the simplest possible kind of case of Chernoff bounds or Huffing bounds. And uh, Chernoff Huffing bounds are always about sums of independent random variables. And we use the independence crucially here. Uh, but then we did use some more facts about the random variables when we literally did this computation here. We used the fact that they're plus or minus one random variables with probably half each. Okay, so if you have like different kinds of random variables, like maybe you have a random variable which is one with probability two thirds and zero with probability one, uh, sorry, one third, uh, or some other like random variable and you're taking independent sums of it, then you have to do a different calculation here. And the ideas are the same, and there's some general theory about like how to handle this situation, but I'm just going to skip all that and tell you the conclusion because this is the idea. And now I will tell you the like optimized forms of the results that you should come to know and enjoy. So yeah, I'll now just state some theorems, which are great theorems that you will use all the time in CS theory work. OK, so I'll say a couple of theorems. Another downside here is there's like, like, not like one like glorious Ur theorem that you just write down and you're just like, I'll use this theorem every time. Like, you always have to use like a slightly different theorem depending on the exact scenario. And there's like many variants. And if you look at you know, Chernoff bounds in Wikipedia, it's like incomprehensible. So I'm trying to like give you like just a couple ones that should get you through like 85% of situations. OK, so let uh, x1, uh, sorry, let x be x1 plus dot 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 plus xn, where the xi's are independent. And they do not have to be identically distributed, which is nice. Maybe I'll try this enormous chalk. We'll see how it goes. And uh, let's write oh, uh, mu for the mean. And generally, you assume you can either compute this or more or less compute this. OK. So the first bound I'll tell you is sometimes called Hufting bound. I don't really know what the standard Anglo pronunciation of his name is, so we'll say Hufting. Uh, and here we're assume, we'll assume that um, xi is, takes values in a bounded range. So we'll say it's between two real numbers, ai and bi. And usually, a, uh, usually all the a's are the same, and usually all the b's are the same. But just in case, like, you can take different bounds for each one. OK, so here you always need to assume like, something about these independent random variables, that they're not too crazy, or you have some control over them in order to deduce a Hufting or Chernoff type bound. Uh, OK, so then Hufting says the following. Then uh, the probability that x, the sum, is bigger than its mean by t, or the probability that x is less than its mean by an additive negative t. These are both bounded by the same thing. And the same thing is e to the minus 2t squared over the sum of the bi minus ai squared. For all t greater than 0. OK, and this one's pretty powerful, and you can use it in a lot of situations. Uh, in particular, you can use it. It should give us back the result we just proved. Well, I erased it. Or, no, I didn't erase it. The result we just proved uh, for this case where the xi's are plus or minus 1 with 50% chance each. In that scenario, we can take all the a's to be minus 1, all the b's to be plus 1. So this is 2 squared, which is 4. So the denominator is 4n. Cancel the twos, you get t squared over 2n. OK, well, I called it u up there, but uh, it's t here. And the mu in our special case up there was 0. OK, so this uh, one directly generalizes this one. And 
Um, it's nice there. You don't need to assume these random variables are 50-50 or anything. They can just be any random variables at all that take values between, let's say, minus 1 and 1 or some bounded range. OK, so that's Hufting. Now I'll show you like a similar but different one, which is Chernoff's bound, um, which can be more effective. Let's say you're summing up 0, 1 random variables. And you know, if these random variables were, let's say, 0 or 1 with constant probability each, then the whole sum would be, have mean proportional to n. Uh, Chernoff's bound is effective when this mean is sort of um, a bit smaller than like n over 2. But maybe let me put a little star next to Chernoff bound, because if you have to remember like just one bound out of this whole lecture. Maybe let it be this one. Try to, try to memorize it. I mean, people will just, when writing a paper, say, oh, by Chernoff bound, this. And you just got to get used to that, get used to using this. So the hypothesis here is that these random variables are between 0 and 1. If you don't have that, you can always, you can typically scale your random variables so they have this property. OK, then. Uh, for all parameters epsilon greater than 0, uh, the probability that the random variable x is sort of, um, you can think of this as like uh, at most 99% its expectation. Okay, so it's at most 1 minus epsilon times its mean. Uh, this is upper bounded by e to the minus epsilon squared over 2 times mu. OK, so a common scenario, you know, maybe epsilon is 0.01. Mu is proportional to n. Uh, OK, and this will say that like uh, the probability that this random variable is less than even 0.99 times its mean. Uh, it's really small. It's e to the some constant times n if the mean is proportional to n. OK, that's quite useful. And on the other side, I'll write something that's like almost perfectly symmetric, but not, sadly. The probability that it's bigger than mu, its mean by a factor of 1 plus epsilon, is at most e to the minus epsilon squared over 2 mu plus epsilon in the denominator, which is a little bit annoying when you're trying to memorize this bound. Then you have to memorize this like hiccup. And unfortunately, you cannot remove this. It's false if you don't put the plus epsilon in the denominator. Now, this is really kind of a bit splitting hairs because you usually use this when epsilon is a very small number, close to 0. So there's basically no difference between 2 and 2 plus epsilon. But you know, if you really want to write a really strong but true statement, then you have to write this. But it's very common to just see people use that like, oh, well, this is at most e to the minus epsilon squared over 3 mu um, if epsilon is at most 1, which it almost always is. And you rarely care too much about this constant here. But uh, see here, it doesn't make sense to even take epsilon bigger than 1. But here, you might take epsilon to be like 5. You're like, oh, I'm interested in the like, rare case that the probability that x is bigger than its mean by a factor of 6. And then and you see, as actually, as epsilon gets larger and larger, this is no longer quadratic in epsilon. If epsilon is actually large, then this becomes linear in epsilon. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this is sort of like uh, for large epsilon, it's roughly x minus uh, epsilon oops, times mu for large epsilon. OK, so yeah, memorize this if you can, because you'll use it 100 or 1,000 times in your life, hopefully. Uh, let me make a small comment here that um, uh, is another true aspect of the Chernoff bound, which people use like all the time without even mentioning it. In fact, I didn't even realize that like, some subtlety is happening until I prepared like, a version of this lecture the first time I taught it which is the following. Uh, 
Many times in this scenario, you cannot actually know the mean exactly, but you have some bound on the mean. So sometimes you might know something like, oh, uh, I don't know the mean, but I know a lower bound, mu L on the mean. And I know the mean is at least um, something. Uh, so it might seem intuitive that you could say, oh, well, the probability that x is less than or equal to 1 minus epsilon times this bound on the mean should also be like small, e to the minus epsilon squared over 2 mu l. Because you're like, well, this is even less than the mean. So like this is even rarer than the event that x is at most 1 minus epsilon times the mean. But I did something subtle here. I put this lower bound in here. Um, oh, actually, that one's fine, right? I mean, really, this would be definitely true if I only put mu in here. So am I eligible to put mu l in here? Yeah, well, actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, I guess, trivial. But on the other side, hopefully it's not trivial, or else this point is moot. Let's say you know, let's say you know mu is at most mu h, high and low, I guess. Uh, can you say that the probability that x is at least 1 plus epsilon times mu h is at most e to the minus epsilon squared, or 2 plus epsilon times mu h? The idea is you're like, oh, I'm going to use this mu h as a proxy for mu. This should be even rarer than the event that you're more than 1 plus epsilon times your mean. But now you did something sneaky because you made this right-hand side even smaller than what it truly should be if you're doing a black box appeal to the theorem. But uh, I'm here to tell you that this is still true. So uh, basically, if you do this intuitive move, like, well, I don't quite know the mean, but I know like, uh, like a bound on the mean, which should make the thing I'm trying to bound even smaller, then you can plug that bound on the mean into the theorem, and it's still true. OK. Let me close with uh, a few things. Um, okay, so I'll tell you, I'll close by writing down one very simple corollary of Chernoff bounds that gets used all the time, which is the bound you use when you're like estimating like a random variable from samples and you want to say that like the empirical average is really close to the true average. There's a couple more versions of Chernoff bounds or Hufting bounds that hold in situations where the random variables are not uh, fully independent. And uh, these bounds that you can use in that case, I'll leave them in the notes, but I don't have time to go over them now. Let me just say uh, in words a little bit about them. So uh, one scenario where you have um, non-independent random variables, but like you somehow feel a turnoff bound should still be true, is when these random variables are like um, somehow negatively correlated. If you're trying to show that the probability of the sum of these random variables is not much bigger than its mean. And uh, they have some kind of like negatively correlated property, which intuitively means that like if one of them is large, the other one should be small. Then it feels like that should only make the turn of bounds like more true. And that's true. Uh, you have to carefully define what it means to have these random variables to have like negative dependence. And the, the right way to do it is with this notion called negative associativity, which I put some references to in the notes. Let me just give you like uh, a couple of examples. Imagine like you take a unit circle and you randomly and independently put down n points on it. So that divides the unit circle into like arc lengths. And you could, these could be your x1 through xn. Uh, and you could maybe take a 
these guys have the property that they always sum up to one. So that actually proves that they're not independent. And I guess it also means there's really no mystery about what's going on with their sum as a random variable. But you could say, like, take the sum of the first uh, n over two of them. So they still wouldn't be independent. But they still intuitively have the property that if I tell you, you know, x7 is big, so like one arc segment is big, kind of makes you feel like, that, well, the other ones have to be small. And you can indeed show that these random variables are negatively associated. And therefore, for any subset of them, turn off bounds still hold. Um, that's an example of that. Uh, another example, when you don't have independent random variables, if you're you have n uh, random variables, and well, let's say you have n independent random variables. Actually, here they will be independent. But uh, you're not necessarily looking at the sum of them. You're only looking at some function of them. But this function has the property that if you change the value of one, any one out of the n random variables, it doesn't change f very much. So f has some kind of like Lipschitz property. Then this is another case where like turn off type bounds hold. And it's called um, McDiarmid's inequality. You can take a look at that. And uh, yeah. Um, well, the last theorem I'll write on the board, and then I'll be done. This is sometimes called the sampling theorem. It's a direct corollary of turnoff bound. And it says the following. Let's say you have a random variable, which is bounded between 0 and 1, it has mean mu. And let's say you get n independent samples from it. Where you get like to see x1 through xn that all have the same distribution as this unknown x, and they're independent. And you estimate the mean in the natural way, mu, as, well, the empirical average over n. This should be close to the true mean, mean you would hope. And it's a direct corollary of uh, turnoff bounds that for all parameters uh, epsilon and delta, uh, if n is bigger than 3 log 1 over delta, I guess this is ln, over epsilon squared, then your estimate will be epsilon accurate, except with probability at most delta. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you use like in polling, right? You want to say that, oh, 19 times out of 20, or delta equals 0.05, my reported mean is within some tolerance epsilon of the true mean. And turnoff bound tells you how many samples you need to take in order to make that true. And it's basically proportional to 1 over epsilon squared. OK, I'll stop there and see you on Thursday. <laughs>